All right, welcome to another Transition Perspective here with SitReps and Steercos. Today we have Glenn Meyer. Uh, I've known Glenn since I was a plebe, and Glenn was uh, yelling at me when he was, I think, some sort of regimental staff at West Point. Um, since then, he's gone on uh, to do other cool stuff. He's going to talk to us a little bit about what he's been doing, help vets that want to do that too. So, Glenn, um, tell us about what you've what what you've been up to. Um, maybe start out with with what you were doing in the military and and kind of how you got to where you're at. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, first of all, so my army career started off in 2006. I actually started off as an enlisted soldier as a crew chief on Apaches. And then from there, I went to the academy uh, at West Point and uh, graduated there in 2012. And I spent eight years on active duty as an infantry officer, decided to make a transition in the spring of 2020. And uh, I started off my my career post army in tech working for Apple, uh, initially in procurement sourcing camera components. I also spent some time doing some finished goods logistics for Apple, uh, mainly focused on air freight. And then recently, uh, I made a transition again from Apple over to Tesla, where I am today. And at Tesla, I'm in their uh, procurement organization within supply chain, and uh, I'm responsible for raw material sourcing, specifically aluminum. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, congrats, first of all, on, on making that transition. Those are two brands that I think a lot of people um, frankly, dream about getting into and would would love to hear a little bit more. A lot of people talk about they want to get into tech. And as your career demonstrates, there are many pieces of tech everywhere from sales to customer success to procurement. Um, could you explain a little bit more about the path that you've taken, what you know, procurement, what sourcing and supply chain means, um, specifically in the context of uh, you know, two, you know, tech companies. So I think what attracted me to supply chain within the tech space, I think, you know, writ large zooming out and just looking at tech before even getting into the supply chain space is I wanted to be part of an organization that did something I was passionate about, something that I was interested in. You know, with Apple, I'm interested in the product line. I use all the products at Tesla. I'm interested in, you know, sustainable energy and the cars and the whole ecosystem. So when you work in an, a type of organization that you have genuine personal interests and passions about, that makes it easy. Going into the supply chain space, so I kind of thought critically like, okay, well, if I'm going to go into the tech world, am I going to be a guy designing and engineering products? Absolutely not. That's not me. Am I going to be a guy doing soft skills, you know, finance, legal, other type functions, sales, like you mentioned? Didn't want to do that either. So I landed on the operation space because I think as an operator in the tech world, you have the opportunity to do things in the army that, or whatever branch of the military you're transitioning out of that you were probably passionate about. The nature of work in the tech operations world is it's a largely flat cross-functional type approach where numerous functions are all working together. It's not hierarchical, you know, like, or a, a, matrix, or, a matrix organization. It's very flat. Uh, very big on collaboration. And I really like that. Um, I would also say it gives you the opportunity to, to be a leader, whether you're an individual contributor or a manager, when you're working in a flat organization like that, you're influencing and leading and being a peer leader every day, whether you're an individual contributor or manager. And then externally, whether you're, whether you're customer facing or supplier facing, you have the opportunity to move the needle and, and enhance your KPIs with your supplier or your customer as a function of, you know, how good of a leader you are based on your experience at the service academies or ROTC and then what you practiced in the military. So for those reasons, I kind of landed on ops and supply chain because those companies spoke to my passion and interest. And I was able to build on those kind of things that I enjoyed about the army, you know, outside of the army. Yeah, and your your background, you talked you were an infantry officer, Apache crew chief. Um yeah. what was your major at West Point? And did you have any kind of, you know, for people that are worried, they say, Hey, I, I can't write JavaScript. I don't yeah. know how to use SQL. Yeah, um, I don't either. <laughs> what was your what was your background? And is there hope yeah. for people that don't have CS master's degrees? Yeah, I no, I definitely think so. Um, my background at West Point was engineering management, or you could call it industrial management. Um just kind of depends on what what flavor the school decides to call their degree but um 
I don't think that you need to have a, a technical degree to immediately succeed in tech. Now, if you want to be someone designing and engineering products, if you want to be solving, you know, full self-driving betas for Tesla and things like that, you probably need those technical skills. But to come in and, and succeed in, you know, operations and supply chain, for instance, and there's other uh, parts of the business that you could come into, that's not the price of admission by any means. So when you were thinking about getting out of the military, how far ahead of time did you say, hey, I need to start networking, making my resume, wh whatever it is that you did, how far out did that start? And, yeah. you know, what were kind of the decision trees that you went through that led to ultimately working at Apple? Yeah. First, I think you need to start like 18 months out. That's when you should really start thinking about when do I want to get out of the military? What do I want to do? Where do I want to live? Because really, in order to set yourself up for success, you need to drop that refrat or UQR like 12 months out. So obviously, you're not going to make an overnight decision with respect to that. So starting that planning process and starting to network and figure out what am I interested in doing? Where do I want to live? Like what path do I need to follow to get to that end goal of, of being in this career post-military life? Starting that 18 months out is the key. So when you hit that 12 month mark, you've got everything teed up, ready to go, and you can just start crossing things off your list. For me, deciding that you know tech and Apple was the start, I thought critically first at a high level about the different types of industries. Like I think you start broad and then just kind of narrow it down. So for me, that looks like consulting, investment banking, and tech. And then I just kind of explored each one of those three, setting up informational calls with people, namely veterans that are in those industries, and just letting them talk about their experiences, how they like it, what their day-to-day -day like is like, what the culture is like, what the growth path is like. Have they been able to utilize the skills that they learned in the military that they were passionate about? Do they feel that sense of purpose, you know, that we all, you know, served for? Um, so I think doing those things enabled me to pare it down from those three industries that I mentioned down to tech. I think you can kind of rule some things out by process of elimination, depending on your interests, your passions, the company culture you're looking for, the work-life balance, the locations, all of those things. And for me, that's, that's the process I went through that ultimately enabled me to pare it down to tech. Yeah. Obviously people know, um, I'm, I'm currently my second year of, of an MBA program. Kyle started this page after getting into an MBA program. Um, wh what was your decision like when you looked at, hey, you know, you have the GI Bill, you can go get an MBA, you can go to a law degree, yeah. you could go get a CS degree. There's, there's a lot of different ways that you could have gone and gotten a, a secondary education, right? Um, yeah. What was your decision like to rule that out? Um, maybe what are some of the benefits that you found and what are some of the trade-offs that people should be aware, um, you know, that are thinking, hey, is, is it worth it for me to go miss out on two years in the career force? And yeah, go, go. my thinking was simple. So I, what I tell people when I do networking calls is I think I think if you don't know exactly what you want to do, that's okay. I think part of going and getting a degree too is the op tempo of our military the last 10 plus years has been through the roof and people are burned out and they need a break. They need to reconnect with their family. They need to learn how to mentally and physically transition themselves from military officer or NCO into, you know, a civilian version of themselves. I think all those things are fine. However, I would say if you can identify where you want to be and say, for instance, I want to be a supply chain guy in tech, right? Or girl. Um, the next question you need to ask yourself, in my view, is what's the price of admission to get to that point? What skills, what credentials, what education, what certification do I need in order to navigate my way into that industry? For me, in my case, being a supply chain guy within tech, I was able to receive an offer without doing an MBA. And when I reviewed, so what I did is I took... I took the numbers of my offer and I compared them to average first year salaries out of M7 schools in tech. And I found that the offer that I got was pretty much right on point with those. So for me, I said, well, if I'm going to take the opportunity cost of two years to go and get an advanced degree, whether it's an MBA or an MS or whatever, there needs to be a return on investment because that's two years of growth in the company, of valuable experience, of compounding interest, 401k benefits, all these things, right? If I'm able to get that same offer that I would get post, you know, uh, graduate degree here and now today, 
Why do I need to go? And I'm going to be ultimately where I want to be. Why do I need to go do that? So that was, that was the kind of drill that I walked through to, to, to nail down on that. I think what you're, you know, from my view, you're starting your work and you're building that experience sooner. Um, and I'll kind of get into this in a minute. I think regardless of whether you come from a professional degree program, MBA or MS or whatever, you're going to have a broad set of skills that you're still going to have to drill down on. You're not going to get to the level of depth and detail that you need within your job in an MBA program or, or other advanced degree program. You're going to need some form of OJT regardless. I think maybe that'll accelerate it depending on your role to some extent coming from that degree program. But in my view, from what I've seen from MBAs versus non-MBAs onboarding, everybody still has to come up to speed. They have to learn the business. They have to learn the lingo, the tools, the processes. And it really takes a good six to 12 months to get to where you're you know, fully self-sufficient in any kind of a high-tech role. So I think it does help, but it, it's not going to forego the need for the OJT when you come online. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd completely agree with that. Um, I mean, I've, I've loved my experience in an MBA. Uh, totally agree with what you say about if you if you don't know what you want to do, you have no clue. Um, it's a great place to go to figure that out where no one will ask questions about why you haven't been working for two years. Um, for vets, the the cost is a lot lower, but like you said, it's not it's not free, right? You you are foregoing in, in your case, uh, you know, mid six figure salary uh, plus options. Obviously, Apple stock and and Tesla stock have done quite well. Um, if you can get those jobs, right? Which is kind of the next question of you know, you, you have a lot of options as you're coming out as a vet, you have military headhunters that will find you a job. There's no, there's no doubt that you can get some form of employment. Um, but getting employment that is going to be beneficial long-term, um, has good compensation trajectory is another thing. How did you, how did you compete for the job that you got, uh, that had a, a very good salary, very good trajectory, without any kind of private sector experience? That is a extremely good question. I think the short answer is twofold. Number one, it's how you translate your military experience, how you brand yourself. I think you really have to think, because of course the military doesn't have KPIs and they don't think about performance and results in the same way that the civilian world does. So I think what you really have to do is you have to think critically about, okay, well, I'm going for a supply chain role, but I would argue that any military officer that has done any sort of job is a supply officer to some extent. Like you can find applicable and relevant experience in what you've done, albeit the industries are different, but you can find that experience that's value add immediately to a company like Apple or Tesla. So I think it's, it's just critical thinking about what have I done really well? Like starting when I think about the resume, I don't think about here's my job description. I think about here's the evidence of excellence. Like here's the top three to five accomplishments that I've done in these roles in the army. And I say, here's the achievement with a data point that makes sense to someone with no military experience. And then here's the impact to that. So it starts with branding and selling yourself in a way where you've translated that military experience to show value add to that company based on what they're looking for. And then second is networking. There is, it seems like the amount of networking and hiring events grows by the day. I mean, there's so many resources out there, like for service academy grads, you have the, the quarterly service academy career conferences, big companies, big, you know, these big tech companies constantly have veteran workshops and things like that for helping you with resumes or bringing you on site to meet people, um, cold calling people on LinkedIn, like the power of LinkedIn can't be understated. I would constantly recommend people to find other veterans that are embedded within these companies and just set up information calls, network, like show your value add and help and let them help you navigate the process. Like that's really the last thing that puts a bow on it is having a transition mentor, somebody that's where you want to be that has navigated that transition successfully. Let them coach and guide you through that process. Yeah, that I, I think that's key to understand how to take your, your experience. And it's oftentimes the things <clears throat> that military veterans don't, I think, value are the things that oftentimes civilians do think are great. Um, you know, getting the best platoon in 
brigade gunnery pr probably won't be that interesting to a civilian hiring manager. And it would probably take you 30 minutes or your entire interview to even explain what gunnery is. But, you know, doing the load, probably, like yeah. su successfully executing a railhead, uh, as much as that probably like sends a shiver down many vets' spines, is a pretty amazing, like when you actually consider what our military is able to do, moving people across continents and doing it fairly effectively, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I, I think that's something that a lot of vets will be like, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying put your UMO certification, but figuring out, hey, what are things that civilians kind of do? And, and what would I, what would I be able to explain easily? Because frankly, in an interview, you just, you don't have time to explain. And, and oftentimes people won't find interesting what a brigade commander might, if you're in that interview. Um, I, I think it really starts with that evidence of excellence. Like, here's the things that I've done really well. You know, you can pull those top three to five achievements from each of the major roles that you've contributed to during your time in the military, and then work with that mentor to say, okay, here's how I translate it in a way that demonstrates a value add to a realistically attainable role that you're going after. How many, how many iterations would you say of your resume uh, did you have to go through? God. Probably 20 plus. Um, I think I spun, that number is probably overly high for me. Um, I think there was a lot of wheel spinning that occurred because I probably didn't bring a mentor online soon enough. But um, I think I think if you do it correctly, you can probably do it in five or less if you have the right person helping you. And I would say too, one of the pitfalls that I see a lot of people fall into with resumes is it's like, they're they're striving for perfection that doesn't exist. Uh, I think we you have to understand that the average recruiter or hiring manager is going to spend 30 to 90 seconds on your resume and that's it. Uh, if it's more than a page, they're not reading any, any more past one page. It needs to be concise, well translated, no filler, just cold hard facts and achievements on what you've done and why you're awesome and why you should get that role. And then I would also say too, Another pitfall that I see people fall into is they shop their res resume around to a lot of great people, but everybody has a different opinion. So you get in kind of a doom loop of never ending edits because one person says change this, then another person says put it in this format, and you just keep going through this vicious cycle. So the advice that I give is find one person, one trusted mentor that's where you want to be or somewhere similar to where you want to be and let them be you know, your mentor, your resume advisor. And when you and said person say it's good enough, then be done with it and move on to, you know, the next step in the value chain, which is networking. Yeah, I I, I totally, I, I resonate with what you said about finding someone in that position similar to you. I, I see a lot of people that will say, I'm going for a sales role. Let me go talk to Glenn. And not that you probably couldn't help with the resume at the first bit, but you're not a salesperson. Yep. Similarly, if I know if I want to work in your in your office and I want to be doing procurement, I probably shouldn't go ask the person that's in sales or or product development. Um, just they're they're, they're looking for different stuff. And yep. you talk about networking. If a vet wants to work at Apple or at Tesla, would you recommend that they just go onto the Apple website? There's job listings. I I could see 20 plus right here and just drop yeah. a resume will that will that will that find me success extremely rarely the way to do it is taking advantage of these opportunities again where you have amazing opportunities to go interact face to face like a service academy career conference other vet hiring conferences if these companies are hosting veteran workshops doing those is extremely beneficial to even get ahead of what you might be able to achieve online with LinkedIn, if those kind of options aren't available to you, then networking with someone on LinkedIn that is already in that industry or ideally at the company that you want to be in and having them help you get your resume in order, coaching you throughout the hiring process, what that looks like, ideally internally referring you, introducing you to hiring managers and recruiters that are key in the, the org that you're looking to gain access to. Those are all much better approaches to have someone from within helping you. The last thing that I would add with respect to that too for people is I would say, don't just open with saying, hey, can you can you give me a referral or can you send my resume over to the recruiter or the hiring manager? I get a lot of those. You have to think about 
the person you're asking to help you is putting their name, their reputation on the line, and they know absolutely nothing about you. I think the appropriate starting point should be, hey, let me let me ask questions about your journey, learn about you, learn about your company, make sure it's a good fit for what I want to do. Let's build the report. Let's build the relationship a little bit. I'm not saying it has to be crazy, but build that credibility with the person that you're asking to put their neck on the line for you and help you and have them validate that, yes, you have a good resume, you have good experience, they think you're a good fit, so they feel comfortable vouching for you and helping you. Yeah, I think that calls back to what you were talking about, 18, you, know, you said 18 months out was not the point that you were applying for a job at Apple, right? That was the not point at, at which you, no. were having, you were having intro calls and setting it up so that three or four months out, that person could go to bat for you, right? Yeah, um, I think most companies operate really on like a one to three month time horizon for being really serious about hiring and bringing people in. If you're if you're past three months out from your available to start work date, doing anything more than networking is really not going to be a useful uh, a good use of your time. Yeah, that's that's typically what we see. Uh, you know, here at Wharton, obviously, I have a I have a, a different perspective than than someone that's going straight in. And MBA hiring is a little bit different, but even then, most most firms will tell second year students we're going to be on campus April graduations in May. Um, unless, unless you're working for someone like consulting or banking that is, or a fortune 500 company that has a hundred thousand plus people. Um, and even then, I mean, Tesla is a fortune 500 company, fortune, fortune 100, right? That they're not, they're not operating on a two year hiring plan, uh, nor is Apple, nor is Google. Um, I, I talked to a, a vet that works HR at Google a, he told me that he, he hired 10 positions for a program manager role had 12,000 applications. And he's, he was like, there's, you know, we have all these algorithms, we have ways to filter, but he's like, at the end of the day, if, if someone is able to tell me this person should be looked at twice, that, that probably has a much higher rate of getting a hire. And he's like, even then it's still about 1%. So, you know, that's, I think that are used to HRC coming down and, um, or whatever the equivalent is, you know, the equivalent branch manager is for the Navy or the Air Force, and yeah. telling you, here's a job. Um, I, I wish it worked like that, um, right? And maybe it, you know, it would have in the, in the Soviet Union, so maybe I don't wish it, it worked like that. But um, yeah. what what resources were you able to use? Were there certifications that you needed before you get got to Apple? Were there training courses that you were doing you know, at night prior to even arriving once you, maybe once you even had an offer to get up to speed and make sure you were ready? The short answer is no. Uh, I didn't need any other certifications or anything like that in my initial role that I started in. Um, and I get that question a lot as well. You know, a lot of people kind of see low hanging fruit in their transition. Maybe they they have a, a lower demand job in their last few months out of the army and they say, well, I can go get a free PMP or I can go be a scrum master or, you know, name your certification. I think if it's low hanging fruit and you have the time and bandwidth to go, you know, develop yourself, I think that's great. But I would recommend doing it in a targeted way. Do it if it's relevant and applicable to your role. And, and most of all, do it if it's needed. You know, I think you're probably better served spending your time networking and trying to build the relationships that are ultimately going to get you the job than doing a certification you don't need. I would say though, if I could go back and do it over again, I would recommend an area of weakness that I see in a lot of transitioning vets within tech is undoubtedly data analytics. I think, you know, obviously we use Excel and stuff like that in the army, but it's, it's nowhere near to the level that it, it's used in industry. So I think there's a lot of really good courses that are out there like LinkedIn learnings, Excel classes, Tableau is another really great platform that's used commonly for data analytics uh, in the tech industry. So my recommendation would be, you know, if you have some time, 30 minutes or an hour a day, like brushing up on those more advanced data analytics type skills will absolutely serve you well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it's funny. We, we definitely do use PowerPoint and Excel in the army. I don't use, know if we use it well, yeah. I've said for a long time, if I was ever secretary of the army for a day, I would make all Bullock classes extend by two weeks and do Excel and PowerPoint uh, crash courses, because really it doesn't take long to learn how to operate Excel in a targeted way, but even just learning how to add columns and use the alt key um, can make things go faster. But yeah, the amount of 
Excel spreadsheets that I got into in the army that were hard coded, impossible to use, took hours to figure out the logic behind them. Um, yeah. It doesn't take long. It, it takes about a week to figure out how to do that. So um, I, I totally agree. I, I tell people a lot that if something is easy to get, um, PMP comes to mind. If a lot of people are, are getting it, the value inherently decreases. Sure. So do something that's targeted, do something that it, you think will actually be useful. And yep. if you talk to people in your career that say that no one has a PMP, maybe, you know, don't do that thing. Um, yep. What's been Let the me just backtrack for one second, because I see something here in my notes I forgot to mention. With respect to the tools and resources, uh, I didn't use this one in particular, but for, for those that are specifically interested in tech, Breakline is a fantastic program that's out there that helps with the full suite of preparation from resume writing, interview prep, networking, making connections and introductions. That's another fantastic one that people should look into. Yeah, break breakline's fantastic. Um it focuses specifically on getting vets into tech. Yeah. Whether you are uh a coming from a professional background, you're trying to transition directly from the military, or maybe you <laughs> did something for a year and you figured out that maybe CPG or construction or whatever it might be might not be your thing. So definitely agree on break line. Um, what has been the most difficult thing for you or what was the most difficult thing those first, you know, couple of years getting out of the military, trying to adjust to a civilian work environment? Yeah. Two things. I think one was a starkly different culture. I came out of the 82nd Airborne Division, post-deployment, back-to-back intensive training cycles, uh, real-world GRF activations, things like that. Um, that level of culture and intensity to Apple during COVID were two grossly different things. So I didn't give myself time to decompress, to unwind, to relax. Because, you know, when you're in the military, you're just like, full send all the time. Right. So that would be one thing that I think was difficult for me. And I think the way that people transitioning out can get ahead of that is, you know, it, I hear it all the time in these networking calls that I take and people are like, oh man, here's, you know, here's when I'm available to work. And I say, where's your transition leave? Like, where, you're going to take a vacation with your family, like let your hair down, unwind, recover, relax. So I would say that is one of the most important things to do in your transition is let yourself mentally and physically relax and recharge your batteries before you go back into it. And I think that putting yourself in a more relaxed state will help ease the the shock of a starkly different culture, regardless of what branch of the military you're coming from. Um, the other thing was just the very stark difference in how civilian companies do business compared to the army. It, there's completely different team structure structures. There's different lingo, different business processes, different tools. And you can't, you can't come in and out horsepower that and say, oh, well, I was a company commander or I was, a you know, a battalion XO or whatever you were and just come in and say, well, I can automatically just out horsepower all this, this development and growth and learning that I have to undertake in this company, regardless of any of that. And the same thing kind of holds true for the, that advanced degree. It's going to take you a good six to 12 months to fully ramp and be, you know, operating completely self-sufficiently in your role. And then the last one, like I touched on a little bit, just the data analytics piece, uh, I, I won't go into it in any further detail, but that's something that will be a ramp as well. If, you know, I think regardless of what industry you go into, uh, the way that companies view and analyze and tell a story with data is going to be starkly different from the military. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with the point about getting some transition leaves, um, whether you're going to a grad school program, I, I remember thinking, and I, I did have some leave, um, which I'm very grateful for. I remember thinking, man, I'm going to go and take a knee at a grad school program and like be able to kind of like explore my life. And it has been so much more hectic and busy than I, than I anticipated. And the same is true of, you know, going into a civilian work space, especially a company like Apple that, that operates at a pretty high op tempo. Um, 
you know, fig figuring out who you are and exactly what you want with life, I think is something that we always, you know, try to figure out. But it, it's something that comes to mind, I think, for a lot of vets, because your transition is such a point. It's a it's a very binary point, right? You're in and then you're out. And you've looked forward to that. We, we always joke that every veteran thinks about one thing every day in common, and that's getting out of the Army or, or the Air Force or Navy or Marines. And when you're out, you're kind of like, well, what's the next you know, we're, we're used to the military having, you know, okay, I'm going to do 18 months of this time, and then I'm going to go do this, and then I'm going to have this course, and then in 20 years, I retire, and there, there's not a linear career like that in, in the civilian sector. Um, you have a few big jumps, and and maybe, you know, maybe it's pretty pretty flat for a while. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, I would tell people, you know, it's good to go and do these preparations of, of trying to get better in terms of your data analytics and Excel and Tableau and those kind of things. Do some LinkedIn learnings that kind of pique your interest from a professional development standpoint that are relevant and applicable to your industry and your company. But it has to be balanced. I think regardless of how much you do, you're not going to out horsepower the need to do that that steep learning curve in OJT when you come online. Yeah. So you have to balance how hard am I going to push on trying to prepare myself versus making sure that you're, you're taking a break and, and being good to yourself and, you know, recovering mentally and physically before you start a new career. Yeah. Um, 100%. I mean, you, you, there's no, there's no case you can read that'll prepare you for the real thing. When you did go into Apple and now at Tesla, what have you found you've leveraged from your time in the military? Yeah. Easy answer. First, I mean, the easy answer is my leadership experience, bar none. Um, you know, I think I think back to like I mentioned, having to ramp in the the company processes and learning the lingo and learning your craft um, in whatever role you're in or whatever industry you're in, uh, and the data analytics or whatever specific technical skills you need to ramp. But I found immediately from day one that my leadership skills had an impact internally. You know, if you're working at a flat organization, like in tech, you have many different functions working together to solve the same problem, like the need to lead, influence, inspire, you know, inspire people, solve problems, set the right example, all those things that defined a good military leader during your time in uniform lead to success and credibility with your internal teams. And then with suppliers, I think there's a pitfall within industry to sometimes treat things like a transaction and not build the relationship with the suppliers. And I think that really makes a huge difference when you invest in your suppliers and customers to the same level that you do your internal teams, like you would, you know, your, your soldiers, sailors, airmen, or Marines while you're serving in the military, people really respond to that. And I call it like the way I, the simplest example I would say is like, there's a banner of excellence, right? And on one side you have, do the bare minimum and on the other side you have give you 110 percent every supplier is going to give you right down the middle regardless just because you're apple or tesla or company x y or z that has a massive amount of credibility and you have a huge contract or whatever you structure you have in place with them but what unlocks that other discretionary half of effort and performance is that leadership building relationships showing them that you care, doing things, making it a two-way street in that you're not just extracting things from them and saying, you know, I'm the customer, you're the supplier, give me all these things. You're doing things to help solve their problems, to make their lives easier, to build the relationship. Um, it, it just, it's so much more effective. So yeah, in short, I would say, if you, if you come into industry, whether it's tech or anything else, I'm 100% convinced that if you treat people the same way that you did as a military leader, you will be successful from the very beginning. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about the, the, the times you had to, uh, you know, you, you were always in the military having to interface with super superiors and subordinates, both of which expected a lot. Um, but also, you know, don't discount the times you had to go, go over to range control, right. And had someone that you had no authority over could tell, you no in an instant with no, repercussions right or you clear cif that. right <laughs> right i mean those kind of yeah. things where it's like hey yeah you, you just got four young soldiers you had to go to an operation in a week you have to go to cif who tells you that they won't be able to outfit them and you have to get them right and you have to figure out 
how am I going to make this happen? Those are very valuable interactions that might frustrate you. But when you actually get into the civilian sector, you find out, wow, the, the, the interactions with CIF are probably a lot more true to life than the interactions you had with your, your soldiers who you could tell you're going to do this because I told you you're going to do this. And if not, I'm going to like, you know, make you come work on the weekends or something. Um, when you think about your career going forward, like I talked about just, just recently, civilian careers don't have a trajectory where Tesla, or, you know, in your case, you started at Apple, right? You were very quickly at Tesla. You're probably not going to be at Tesla the rest of your career. When you look at things, Apple didn't come down and sit and say, all right, Glenn, 18 months, you're going to hit this, this mark. We're going to send you to this course in Cupertino. Then you're going to go to this. In 20 years, you're going to retire. How do you think about having this very non-linear career path now? Yeah. How do you successfully plan for that? That's a really good question, too. Um, yeah, I think in the military, it's completely spelled out for you. Like, you have a little bit of wiggle room, right? Like, you can do, a, maybe you can do a, a cool broadening assignment when you have that opportunity post-KD positions or those kind of things. But you hit the nail on the head in industry, it's completely non-linear. So I think... I think what I tell people, the the appropriate starting point is what's what's at the top of the mountain? Like, what role do you ultimately want? Is that C-suite? Is that a VP level? What, you know, what industry slash company do you want that to be in? And then from there, working with a mentor, again, I think is hugely valuable going through this process. Again, ideally, somebody that's kind of at that level that can help shape what gaps you need to fill in. And I think, you know, I've seen templates of kind of this career triangle or career pyramid where you, like I said, you start at the top and say, here's the mountaintop, here's where I ultimately want to be. And then you can list those skills and key positions that you need to fill in along the way to make yourself competitive and qualified for that. I think that's the appropriate drill to do. And like you said, it, it may not be non, it, it, it's a nonlinear path. You know, there's not this there's not a, a field manual or army regulation or military, you know, anything that says, here's the path that you have to follow to be a C-suite person or a VP level, you know, in tech or in consulting or wherever you want to be. So I think it's up to you to define what that is and then work with a mentor to fill in those skills gaps and experience gaps along the way and, you know, continue to revisit that on at least like an annual basis. Yeah, I I think that that is one reason I I I have my theory about that a lot of vets do like banking and consulting because they're they are a pretty linear path, right? It's it's pretty well spelled out, it's very hierarchical. And you, you stay for long enough and you know exactly where you're going to be. Um but the reality is even most vets that get into consulting or banking, largely because not because they'll be, you know, they, they will be asked to leave, will eventually have to face the fact that you're going to have nonlinear career that might have drops in pay, might have big, big bumps. Um, you know, civilian pay is largely not determined by your base salary, uh, as you've learned at Tesla and, and Apple. Um, it's normally a, a good company to be at that pays you well, um, not just in your base salary. Um, but any, any departing thoughts, um, for, for, for vets that you, you'd provide and, and maybe how, how can a vet, if they're interested in, in pursuing your path, um, you know, contact you or contact others and, and get in touch with people to help them, you know, on their journey. Now, the only parting shot I would say is take ownership of your transition journey. Like you're, you're no longer captive to needs of insert, you know, branch of the service. It's completely what you want to do. So define and think critically about that and say, here's the industry and company I want to work for. Here's where I want to live. Here's what I want to go do. And then figure out the requirements that you need to get there, whether that's education, certifications, who you network with, like build that out and then go aggressively out. Just like anybody would any military operation, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go on any military operation unprepared. You shouldn't go on your transition prepared. And it's really up to you to take ownership of that and figure out what you want to do and then run with it. But I think there's so many great people out there that are willing to help you know there's other organizations like sit reps there's veterati there's service to school there's so many great free resources that are out there for people so you just got to go ask and go look for those things that are you know going to be a value add to help you get where you want to be and then for me personally i'm pretty easy to find on linkedin i will say uh, i will at least take an intro call from at pretty much any person that reaches out and I'm, you know, I'm happy to help and offer guidance. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Glenn.
Um, this has been great. Congrats again on the success you've been able to find. And good luck to anyone watching that wants to uh, wants to pursue this this path. Great catching up, Wyatt. Glad you're doing well. And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Thanks.